How many of you know that voice of truth? How many of you have ever said, you who, where are you? Because <laughs> there's a lot of other voices you can hear, right? Yeah. Well, today we want to look at that through a context called Lessons in Truth. But let's start at the beginning. At St. Mary's Parish Church, every single Sunday, as the priest approached the podium, he always began with the traditional call and response. It was the salutation of familiar exchange. Many of you probably know it. As soon as he approached the podium, he always said, the Lord be with you. And the congregation replied, the Lord be with you. One morning, there was an issue with the sound system. He approached the podium and said, there's something wrong with my mic. I loved when I heard that because I thought it so highlights things that really happen in life. You know, number one, kind of the obvious, is how we get stuck in our automatic responses, our patterns, our habits, our routines, not just in our communications, but in our living and in our life. You know, you all, we all have, you have your habits, your patterns, your way of doing things and being things and responding. And so often like this, rather than hearing what was actually being said in the moment, rather than truly being present, we just responded from autopilot. And so we all have that. We all know that. And, you know, there's a part of what we do in a very habitual way that serves us well. And if we really begin to examine ourselves, we come to find out and say, oy vey, there's some in patterned responses and thoughts and ways that we show up that are just quite habitual and not necessarily based on what the moment may be calling forth. And so that, that incident that happened in that Catholic church that morning really highlighted that, but it also highlighted something else. How often when something is out of sync, the congregation and the minister were out of sync there for a moment, how often when something messes up, it's not working, when there's a flaw that comes up to the surface, how often is what we hear, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with me. I will never forget in my first ministry in Lawrence, Kansas, I had been there, I don't know how many months, maybe six or nine months. And as a new person coming out of seminary, it's a little intimidating. Okay, it's a lot intimidating when you first start your ministry. Lawrence, Kansas has one of the highest PhDs per capita in anywhere. There's a university. I had a lot of uh, professors in my congregation, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, I've got a southern accent, and this is just like, I, you know. So you just are a little self-conscious at times. But the first six months or so, everything's going really well, and it was I'd line up afterwards and shake people's hands, and almost everybody would say, you know, you really spoke to me today. That was so helpful. One day, a woman just kind of hung back, and when she came through, she looked at me and said, that was the poorest excuse for a sermon I've ever heard in my life. My first thought was, I knew it. <laughs> the second thought was, they've all been lying to me. <laughs> my third thought was, catch yourself, this woman is still in front of you. <laughs> and so taking a deep breath, I said, tell me more. And she said, this week my children insisted that I turn in my driver's license. 
I can't drive anymore. And they want me to get out and do things and say they brought me here this morning and dropped me off and said that they were sure I would enjoy it. Now it was beginning to make sense. And so interestingly, she did continue to come and we did form a sweet relationship. And she did have a tendency to tell me what she liked and what she <laughs> didn't. <laughs> but I learned something powerful in that moment. I thought, wow, of all the spiritual work I've done, there's still something sometimes that rises up in me that says, mm, you, you know, you're not enough. They've seen through. You're, you're not enough. You're not good enough. You don't have what it takes. And what I want us to know is that's part of the human experience. Now, everybody experiences it in their own way, your own flavor around different areas of our life, your life, and it will sound however it sounds in your life. But that powerful incident that happened in that church really, to me, reveals a couple of powerful things. And these things, if you look at it, are really the essence of our life and surely the focus of a spiritual life and a spiritual path. Number one, it is to look at our routines, our habits, which create our actions. To be in relationship with our own actions. To hold ourselves accountable for those actions. Amen? You know, the days of saying, the devil made me do it. I'm sorry. That's an excuse that Flip Wilson used, but that doesn't hold up. The devil did not make you do it. And so holding ourselves accountable for our actions. The second thing is looking at our beliefs. What are we believing here? And as a part of our belief is our consciousness. What is in my consciousness? What's way down in the dark recesses of my subconscious mind that sometimes rises up that's a part of our race history, that's a part of our ancestry? What's that that rises up sometimes that says you're not something that's rising up to be healed from where you are at that point in time? Amen? It's ready to be evolved through you in a higher way. So there's our actions, there's our beliefs, which is part of our consciousness, and then there's the self. That all of these things are taking place within the individual, that are we examining ourself? Are we taking inventory of our actions and our beliefs, our consciousness? And then that together leads us to the question to say, well, do I believe that I can change, that I can transform do I believe there's more to me than meets the eye? Do I believe I'm a spiritual being living in a reality that is far greater than just this physical body? How many of you know you are part of a spiritual reality and a greater reality of being? And so therein lies God, our potential. And so there's our actions, our beliefs, and our consciousness. There's our self and our God and our potential. And all of these things, whether we're aware of it or not, it constitutes our life, and it certainly constitutes a spiritual life and a spiritual path. And so whatever the path, whether, whatever the religion, the spiritual tradition, the philosophical teachings, self-help, whether it's a values-based life, all of those are there to help us look at how we're showing up and to dig in and to lay hold of our potential to change, to transform, to grow, to be more, and to be in relationship with one another and with this cosmic presence that we could call God. Now, unity is just like every other spiritual path in approaching these things. And so this month, I want to look at some of the foundations and some of the foundational ideas that are now a part of what we call unity. And unity is a part of what we call new thought. And it is based on spiritual principles and spiritual practices, our actions and our beliefs, and how they show up in ourself and how we are connected and part of the whole. And if I start with one of the beginnings in unity, it's going to be a book titled Lessons in Truth. 
And so I want to tell you a little bit about where this came from. You're looking at the author of the book, H. Emily Cady. You can see the years of her life, 1848 through 1941, which gives you a clue as to what the language in this book may sound like. I have a copy from 1962 as well. It's not been changed, changed a whole lot. And so it's very, the languaging in the book was written at that time in history. It was coming from someone with a Christian background, so it has a lot of scripture and Bible references but what came out of the book was very revolutionary. It was radical at the time. It was incredibly different than what was being offered, especially through the different varying Christian traditions in the United States. It was radically different. And it was uh, dovetailing with... Um, Henry David Thoreau and Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and the transcendentalist movement, which was that whole idea that said there's an oversoul, that it's not that we're just a wave in the ocean, it's that the ocean is what constitutes the wave of our being. And these ideas were beginning to sweep through the country and that there was an inherent goodness within them. So it was in this time... That, that this book and these ideas came, came around. And as I said, they were a pretty big departure from traditional Christianity, traditional understanding. We're going to dig into it more as the weeks go on, but just to kind of over-highlight it, Emily Cady, she really encouraged personal accountability and responsibility. Now, this was at a time in the United States where a lot of emphasis in Christianity was on, um, was on the, the, that fatalism, that you are destined. Whatever happens to you, you're destined. There wasn't a lot of power given to the individual. It was all a man in the sky that well, you were hoping you did things right and could get the grace of that. And so in that kind of atmosphere of saying there's not a lot of hope for the individual unless God intervenes for you, this whole other idea began to rise up and out of that. So she taught that individuals had power in their lives, but it required us to be available of our thoughts and our, to be aware of our thoughts, our beliefs, our awareness, and our connection with ourself and the divine. She taught practical ways. This book is filled with practical ways of how to tune in and connect with your nature. And again, as it was written in the 1800s, it's got language of that time. Now today... I still read this book. I still find great value in it. But do I think everything is in it accurate? Absolutely not. It was written a long time ago. Do I resonate with a lot of the languaging, the way it's used? No, I would change it. But unity, and I appreciate this, has not changed the text because I think we're all wise enough and mature enough and have critical thinking skills enough to be able to use source material to have it inform you know, what we're doing today. I think that there's a lot of value in that. And so to any unity student, any truth student, whether it's religious science, uh, you're, you're, you would find this book. Um, she incorporated, again, a lot of, a lot of scripture in it. And a little bit about her, Emily Cady, again, born in 1948. Now, she lived to be 92 years old. During that time, she was born in, thank you, 1848, yeah. <laughs> 1848 to 1941, she lived to be 92 years old. In that time, that was long. That was a long lifespan. She was born in Dryden, New York. She graduated. She went to high school. And when she graduated, she became a teacher. And she taught in a one-room classroom right there in her hometown in Dryden. But she always had a curious mind. She grew up in a Christian home and considered herself spiritual. Was a forward thinker in many ways. In the late 1800s, she decided to pursue the field of medicine, which really was not at all open to women at that time. She enrolled in the homeopathic college in New York City, and she graduated in 1871. Dr. Emily Cady became one of the first doctors in the United States, graduating. 
She also became a student of Emma Curtis Hopkins. Some of you may remember that name. She was a teacher of teachers and, and studied the Bible and was studying the body and all of these things. And it led her, she spent a lot of time, we know, in prayer and meditation. She spent a lot of time with the scriptures. But I resonate with her because I had a, a similar background in that I grew up Pentecostal. I was steeped in the scriptures. It really served me well. And I had a very different belief system when I was younger than I do today. I have not thrown away the baby with the bathwater. I have simply allowed my beliefs to be refined and evolved over time. But I realize what happened for me is when I could no longer believe it as it was being presented, and I walked away, I personally started having dreams, and I would hear the scriptures, but I was hearing them from another level of being. I was beginning to understand that Jesus and the Christ were two different things. I was arriving at some kind of understanding that was just somehow emerging from things that I had read years ago that were coming together in a new way. She had that same experience as well. And so she began writing articles. She wrote an article titled, Finding the Christ in Ourself. Now again, go back, in, go back in time and see that article, Finding the Christ in Yourself. That was blasphemous. It was blasphemous exactly at that time. Not only did she write the article, she sent it to Charles Fillmore. She had heard of Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, and so she sent the article to them they were publishing this little magazine. This one comes from 1927. And this, of course, that one preceded this. It used to be called uh, New Thought, and now it's, I mean, Modern Thought. Now it's called Unity Magazine. And in 1927, interestingly, a woman from Asheville, North Carolina, is quoted in this magazine. Yeah, we, we've got roots around here. But she wrote and ask if they would publish it in this magazine. And so they did. They published her first article that was titled Finding the Christ in Ourselves. And here's an excerpt. This is how it's described. She said, There were in the person of Jesus two distinct regions. There was the fleshly mortal part, which was Jesus the Son of Man. Then there was the central living real part, which was Spirit, Son of God. That was the Christ. In him, the anointed. So each of us, we too, have these two regions of being. One is the fleshly mortal part, which is always feeling its weakness and insufficiency in all things. It's always saying, I can't. And then the very center of our being, there's something which in our highest moments knows that we are more than conquerors. And it says, I can and I will because I am. That it rises up into that. She began to promote the idea of a universal Christ consciousness and a Christ nature that was a part of every being. And she said that Jesus was absolutely exceptional and unique because he demonstrated it. But he told us we were here to demonstrate the same thing. And so again, you can see that this was very, very radical in the time. And if you know anything about Unity's teachings, it is the foundation of New Thought teachings today. Now, these ideas that she was circulating was also beginning to circulate a little bit in the United States at that time. In 1893, there was the first parliament of the world's religions in Chicago. I believe she went. I know that Charles and Myrtle Fillmore went. In 1893, the World Congress building in Chicago, people came from all over the world as they could, Muslim, Jew, Christian, Sikh, Hindu, indigenous, whatever, came together and in their coming together, they began to realize that though they called it different names, there was something very similar. The mystic Christians, such as the Fillmores that were there, were talking about the Christ within us, which is the pattern. It's the, it is the spirit of, of your perfection. It's the, the image of what a human divine being is in its fullness and in its potential. We call that the Christ, and it's a part of our reality of our being. What they discovered when they talked to the Buddhist 
is that the Buddhists call something your Buddha nature. And they believe that within every body is an enlightened state of being that's just waiting to be realized. They talk to the Hindus. The Hindus have a term called Atman. Atman is a Sanskrit word for the true essence and eternal self of every being. The Hindus teach that the Atman, that, there's a perp, that there is the essential being within, within every human being that is waiting to be brought to the surface. And when you add that to the transcendentalist, they begin to see the universal truths, hence the name unity, begin to arise out of that. That while it had roots in mystical Christianity, unity began to realize that these ideas, that the ones that really would stand, you can find them said in varying ways in many of the world's traditions. And so it was in 1893 that that happened. The following year, 1894, the Fillmores asked Emily Cady if she would begin to write more articles. And so for two years, she wrote articles and sent them, and they were published in these magazines over a series of months. The reception to those articles were greater than any they'd ever heard before. And so in 1896, they took all of her lessons and they bound them in a book and called it Lessons in Truth. And that's where this book came from. It literally is the lessons that she had written that went out in these magazines many, many years ago. Now, since it's been updated and most of the copies look like this, it's one of the few books, if you go online and look, and we can give you the link, you can download the whole text yourself. You can even download the original text from the 1800s and read that if you like. It's free to do that. They give it away. It's now been, there's now been two or three million copies produced. It's now available in 11 languages and Braille. It's one of the few New Thought books that really has made its way around. She went on to some of the things that she described when she talked about God. She said, rather than God being a father in the sky, God is spirit, or the creative energy that is the cause of all visible things. God as spirit is the visible life and intelligence underlying all physical things. There could be no body, no visible part to anything unless there was first spirit as creative cause. It is not light reading. It's not easy reading, but there's a lot of richness. Now, interestingly, she goes on through the book and quite frequently refers to God as father. But in her mind, she's referring to God as the father principle, this principle that she describes in the book. So I think some of you would really enjoy it, and some of you would probably say, I couldn't read this book if you paid me to. So you have to figure out if it's anything that, that speaks to you or not. Dorothy Dennett loves the book and has taught it in other churches, and she's really ready to teach it here on, on Sundays afterward. So the, when she begins the book, in the, in the first chapter when it was published, this powerful title says, Bondage or Liberty, which <laughs> she just gets right to the point, bondage or liberty, which kind of life do you want to live? And what she's drawing from, I would describe it like this. There's a teaching where Jesus is teaching to a group of people and he says, if you're going to build a house, what would happen if you build that house on sand? And the rains and the winds, it reminds me of the story of the three little pigs. They blow the house down. The, that, but Jesus didn't talk about the three little pigs. He talked about two houses, the house on the sand and the house on the stone. He said, what would happen if you built your house on the sand? And everybody said, of course, it's not going to stand up. And what would happen if you built your house on the solid stone? That would stand. That's where we want to build. And he looked at them and said, and so do that. And what he was saying is build your, the foundation of your being, build your frame of reference on the part of you that doesn't come and go. Build it on the eternal, the enduring, build it on that part. 
Myrtle Fillmore, when she was sick and experienced a healing, many of you know the story, in the late 1800s, she had had tuberculosis, a diagnosis that in that time was usually a death sentence. She was in the end stages of her life, very, very sick, but she had three sons and a husband and family. She didn't want to die. And so looking for help, she went out one night and she and her husband were managed to attend a um, a lesson by Dr. E.B. Weeks, and she heard him say, you're a child of God, you don't inherit sickness. Now that landed in her in a resounding way because she had always believed she had inherited a sickly body. And when she heard those words, you don't inherit sickness, you inherit the life of God. Something in her woke up, and she began to put more focus on the life within her that was part of the life of God, then she put on the conditions. Now, this is important. It did not mean that she stuck her head in the ground and said, oh, I'm well, I'm not sick anymore. No. There are facts and there are truth. Spiritual path is about bringing truth to the facts. And so she dealt with the illness. She took care of herself. She treated it. She did the best she could. But with everything in her being, she held on to a higher truth. And through that, over a course of about 18 months, she experienced a complete healing. And so the Fillmores and Emily Cady had experienced these healings, and they knew something was happening and and something was changing in their lives. Myrtle Fillmore went on to say one day, She was walking and she picked up a a seed on the ground. I like to think it was an acorn seed. How many of you know what an acorn seed turns into? An oak tree. I've got several oak trees in my yard and I love to pick up an acorn. Myrtle Fillmore one day was walking and she saw a seed and she picked it up. When she was holding it, she looked at that seed and she said, as lives the flower in the seed, so lives the Christ in me. As lives the oak tree in the acorn, so lives the Christ in me, you could say. And she began to realize that, you know, we pick things up and we look at a seed and you can see it as just that. I can look at you, Ken, and see you're a beautiful seed called Ken. There's your image. But I can also know that within This acorn, it's not just an acorn. Its whole purpose is a seed. It has within it nothing less than what we would call magic. It has within it the intelligence, the blueprint, the potential to become a mighty oak tree. In that little teeny seed, what it really is, is potential in becoming And so when you look at an individual and when we look at ourselves and realize we are so much more potential in becoming. And the potential is not only physical and mental in the ways we experience it, but it it is spiritual. And so it's that what we call the Christ. It's that spirit within us, that Holy Spirit within us. That is that is calling us as we're reaching for it. Sarah, would you give us that song? So I want to tie this up with a true story. There's a woman named Jennifer Swantkowski. She's a PhD social worker. I'm pretty sure she's in Texas because she had reached out and made contact with the Unity Ministry there. We know she has some familiarity with the ideas. Again, she's a PhD social worker and she's written a book called The Waiting Room. And in it, she tells part of her life story that there was a time in her life when she was very, very sick. And no one could figure out what's going on. And I don't know if you've ever been through that or had a family member like that. I've got a family member now. It's just so frustrating when you can see them sick and see them deteriorating. And yet nobody can tell them what's causing it. Not only do they not feel good, they start to feel like they're crazy. You know, what's what's causing this? Well, that's exactly where she was. She had finally gone to another doctor and been in, and that same thing happened. And she said she was walking back to her car. And there's a part of her just feeling like, I just, I, I, I surrender, I give up. I just, I don't know what to do. I just do not know what to do. And she said in that moment, in the parking lot, standing right by her car, 
something within her, she said she literally felt it rise up within her and it almost felt like a hug from within. And it said, you are going to be okay. He said, I, I just stood frozen because something had just happened. I was ready to give up. And it's like something from deep within me made its way to the surface and literally a warmth that held me. And I heard from within just as clear as day, you are going to be okay. She said, in that moment, I, I knew what it is when the scriptures say, it is well with my soul. Come hell or high water, come what may, I am going to be okay. How many of you have had that voice rise up? Caught glimpses of it. The situation out here may or may not change, but what definitely changes is we change. That there's a kind of letting go and we begin to live into and from another level of our being. That is always reaching for us. And so the question is, with our habits and our actions, with our beliefs and our consciousness, with our self and with our potential in our God, are we doing all we can to lean into that and to reach for that and to give ourselves to that, to have that dimension of our being be the foundation of who we know ourselves to be. We're going to dig into this this month, and I hope you'll join me. This song is one that, that I wrote back in 2010 at a time when I was going through some changes. The words are very simple, but they say it all. It says, to reveal the divine is to really understand that you are here to realize all that you are. That far beyond the reflection in the mirror, you are the reflection of the one life. That far beyond any circumstance you are here as an expression of the one power and the one presence. No matter the past, you are here in this present moment as a doorway to the one Holy Spirit presence. And there is great joy in knowing that we are that doorway, 
that I am that. That I am the seed and the becoming. I am the form and the spirit. And that which I call the Christ, the Atman, the divine spirit, is that within me that is working uniquely in me to grow me into my highest potential. It will always grow me in the direction of love and wisdom and universal connection. That there is one power and one presence and that one power can be directed as a presence for constructive good or for destruction, deconstruction. And so I open my life and open to that power for purposes of good, of creation, of healing, of transformation. And I make time to center my awareness deep within, to connect with this dimension of my being that is far beyond the reflection in the mirror, to see myself as the reflection and expression of the one life and all that flows through that as me. So I allow myself to feel hope. Hope in my life. Hope in my community. Hope in my country. We were not created to live beneath our potential. We were not created to destroy and undermine our own better angels. We are created and wired to bring forth our essence, our gifts. And so we let go and allow and we strive in that direction. And whatever comes before us as we tend to it, we also attend to our spirit and our connection there. That we may always come from that place of remembrance and of connection. You are here to reveal yourself, and yourself is divine. You are right where you are to reveal your greater self, and that is divine. You are right where you need to be in this moment to help move you into your next. You are here to reveal your divine, your potential, your true self. And yes, you have what it takes. You are here, you are here to reveal the divine